Okay, uh, welcome everyone to this Wise Words seminar uh, hosted by the Contemplative Studies Center. I'm Julieta Galante, uh, Deputy Director of the Center. And um, first I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the unceded land of, on which we work, learn and live, uh, the Wurundjeri, Buburang and Banurang peoples. Sorry about this, I just lost my notes. All right. We pay respect to the elders past, present and future and to any indigenous people present today. Today we're joined by Dr. Sarah Rahmani Lecture in Religious Studies at Te Herenga Waka, Victoria University of Wellington. Sarah's research is focused on meditation movements, atheism, non-religion, and contemporary religious change. Sarah's talk today will draw on interviews to explore the impact of mindfulness meditation and examine how mindfulness, initially embraced as a secular technique, uh, can evolve into a profound source of meaning shaping individuals' values, self-concept, and worldviews. Please save your questions until the end of the talk, and uh, we're going to film this event, but the audience members won't be on camera. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you for having me here, um, Ilieta. I'm going to also have my notes at hand in case I forget what I'm talking about. Um, so yeah, my talk today is going to be exactly what it says on the slide. I'm going to look at uh, patterns of religious change among mindfulness teachers and meditators. And um, at the end of my talk, I'm going to also introduce the scale that we've just developed with my colleagues from Coventry University, um, which is designed to measure people's beliefs and assumptions that they bring with themselves about the transformative powers of mindfulness. Um, so I'm gonna, you know, they're, they're quite in related and both, uh, both sections of this talk are based on my research that was funded by Understanding Unbelief um, that I undertook between 2017 and 18. Um, the methods I'm using and the stuff that I'm presenting today, it's based on ethnographic field work that I took between that period. Um, where did I go? Uh, I'm using in-depth semi-structured interviews with 32 uh, meditators who, um, well, presented or self-identified as non-believers. So that's an umbrella category to encompass atheism agnosticism, religious nuns, and uh, so on. Um, the design of the study was longitudinal, so I wanted to get back to the same group of people, 22 of the 32, um, and really understand what has changed, okay? And I'm going to walk you through my sort of theoretical framework of how I'm actually trying to measure that change. What am I looking for? to find whether there is a kind of trajectory of change um, in worldviews, sense of self, and so on. Um, so the initial interviews uh, looked at people's backgrounds, uh, conversations around what their religious upbringing was like, um, what, what, how did they end up at mindfulness meditations, what they learned from it, um, what they find most valuable, their concept of religion, what does spirituality mean, where does mindfulness sit on the spectrum, if at all, maybe it's outside of the spectrum, um, what is reality? So abstract questions as well, as well as some provocative questions about the use of mindfulness in the military. Where do you ethically position on that? Do you agree with it? Do you find it problematic? And so on. Um, the follow-ups were roughly about eight months, and they're individually designed because each interview took a direction of its own. Um, the method of analysis that I'm using is a dynamic combination of thematic and structural analysis. 
what that means is I'm not just looking at content of what people say, but I'm also looking at how they say it, why they are saying what they're saying, how do they, um, what are the kind of self, senses of self that they like to present to me, what is the agenda, how, what are the sociocultural st structures, the broader context of histories, of linguistic structures that shape the way they're talking or their discourse and so on. So it's, a, it's not, I'm not just mining the interview for biographical information, but I'm looking at how people talk and what that possibly means. Um, so just to kind of give you a sense of the depth of the ethnographic field work. The first thing that I did um, was take a master class at Oxford Mindfulness Center um, and this was presented by Willem Kuchen, which most of you would know who this person is. Um, and this particular masterclass was about how to take, you know, it was pitched for advanced level kind of mindfulness teachers. And essentially it was about how to pitch <coughs> your commodity to the corporate world. Um, some of the stuff that I heard at this and uh, that I'm going to relay and I found quite fascinating was Kirkin encouraging them to be meticulous with the words they choose. Don't say it's Buddhism, say that it's a, I don't know, X, Y, Z. Emphasize words like resilience. And he gave an example of his own work. He said, when I go to the parliament and I want to pitch this to, you know, people at the parliament in the UK, I put I use the words of neuroscience and resilience, and I then back my talk up with a huge, gigantic logo of Oxford University. And then he says, yeah, and then he says, this is no issue in that because the Buddha himself changed his language when he took the, you know, his teachings to the king. So that was that. Uh, I saw John Kabat-Zinn um, do a talk on the future of mindfulness. Um, essentially, I'm going to just give you a snapshot of each of these events. Uh, here he said and talked about the uh, big uh, $7 million funding that the William Kirkin Research Group has received and said 20 years ago that would have been unimaginable. People would have laughed, but now Oxford University, the most august university in the world, has a mindfulness center. Things have changed. So, I'm going to return to all of these nuances of what I'm kind of giving you here. But let's move on. I did a mindfulness in school project. Again, lots of people were brought in to give examples of what language works best at, to what purpose. Um, I saw Mark Williams give a really cheap talk. <laughs> um, and talking about how to manage this hype about the positive effects and actually where is mindfulness most effective. Um, his understanding was that it works best at seasonal depression once it's accommodated with medication and so on. Uh, I took a free intro to comedies based on mindfulness. I did Mindful Living Show, um, which was basically lots of different people, teachers, selling products from you know, mindfulness walks to mindfulness for children to baby toys for mindful coffee, mindful chocolate, uh, mindful orgasm, my favorite talk, um, which is actually an, an organization under federal investigation um, you would like to know. And of course, a classic eight-week MBCT course at Oxford Mindfulness Center where I observed that process of students being socialized into a particular way of talking, a particular way of understanding their senses, their emotions, their reading their thoughts and what they mean, a particular way of talking about them. It, this whole process of you know, sitting back and watching that was quite interesting. Um, I saw, and I'm paraphrasing here um, because I wasn't allowed to take direct notes. <laughs> um, I saw uh, for instance, a teacher asking the students, okay, what are you observing now? And the participant would say something like, oh, my heart is growing, my mind is opened, I'm, I'm feeling lighter. And the teacher would say, do you mean your heart was beating faster? 
why am I trying to emphasize this linguistic change? Um, I'm coming from a discipline where if I want to measure someone's belief, unfortunately, I can't crack into their head. Uh, I, it's not accessible to me what Yulietza thinks about life. Um, all that I have is what she would communicate to me through language, through stories. And that's the material that I have. I can't just assume, you know, what you really believe. So from my disciplinary perspective, language narrative is the actual material, the tangible material that I have at my hand, and that's what I'm going to use to analyze uh, any process of change that I'm looking for. And this is actually based on uh, Mead's, uh, the theoretical framework is based on Mead's concept of universe of discourse. Uh, what that means is that human beings orient themselves to the world from a set of taken for granted assumptions, which are essentially embedded in language. This universe of discourse provides people with a framework for interpreting themselves, interpreting others, interpreting events, and so on. So, you know, some, I would actually take that a little bit farther from a sort of linguistic philosophy and say that transformation itself actually takes place in language. Okay, but we don't want to open that can of worms just yet. Um, so what would that mean? That means, for instance, if I'm measuring a person's change in belief, I'm going to be conceptualizing that as movement or migration from one universe of discourse, which gives you a sense of placing in the world to interpret things, migrating to another universe of discourse. And that migration, we can look at that process in the way people talk, okay? What they would do typically if a person has had a radical change in their sense of, you know, in, in their sense of self and, and, and all of that, they would use biographical reconstruction. So sociological literature, anthropological literature over and over has proved that this is a rhetorical strategy, very common when conversion is happening. What it means is people follow this formula of then I thought, but now I know. I used to be ignorant towards the true cause of my suffering, but now from the enlightened present, I understand why I was suffering. It was because I was having attachment. It was because X, Y, Z, right? And each tradition gives you a whole set of language and ideas and concept to create a new sense of understanding. Okay, um, and, and when people are going through this process of conversion, they use this a lot, constantly kind of reflecting, and that actually it helps them to develop this new sense of self. Um, what else do they say? Uh, there's another pattern that you can observe in just language, the way people talk, is adoption of a master attribution scheme. What does that mean? So it's not just that I now understand my suffering was caused by my attachment to things, is that your suffering is also caused by that. So extending that understanding to everyone else, and extending that understanding and interpreting everything through that lens, right? So your suffering in life is also caused by that. Um, so the first two are, clear, observable changes in the way people talk when they embark on this process of conversion. The latter two that I'm introducing are actually signs of commitment when a person has really full on committed to that tradition. They embrace the convert rule, which means basically, you know, as individuals, we have different sides of to, or different identities. I'm Sarah, to my dad, I'm a daughter, to my students, I'm a lecturer, X, Y, Z, I think I'm an artist, but not really, that's debatable. But when people become committed, they operate from the one, like this identity as a meditator comes to the fore in most social interactions. So for instance, on my research on Goenka's Vipassana movement, you know, some of the observable things are, you know, meditators walk really slowly and they talk very kind of measured, careful not to give too much 
you know, um, expressions and very measured, like those are markers, performative markers of, oh, this person is a 10-year meditator. Like, you know, you can see that. Um, okay, let's move on. They also suspend, there's a suspension of analogical reasoning. What that means is people are, tend to be reluctant to compare their tradition with anyone else because their tradition is the one truth and everyone else is mistaken in some way. And we can see this in mindfulness meditation, how, for instance, is, this is not Buddhism, this is mindfulness. The Buddha was saying something else. This is actually what the Buddha was saying. This is not religion, and so on and so forth. And I'll come back to this later on and give you indexes of what that means, really. Um, all right, so how much time do I have? <laughs> Wasted so much, probably, on just my theory. OK, so I'm going to just introduce you to my participants for this research. 18 women and 14 men between the ages of um, 19 and 69, uh, half were from UK, half from US. Uh, again, an, another half split, but this was not intentional. Um, 16 participants were introduced or practiced mindfulness that I'm calling institutionalized. That's mindfulness that is structured, like MBCT, MBSR, and that sort of thing. 16 were doing or practicing unstructured meditation. And by that, I mean people who um, meditated with their therapists, people who meditated on apps, people who uh, did it on CDs and books and so on. So they didn't take an official formal training. Um, they had different levels of engagement. So most were, um, I think this is 10. I'm sorry, you can't see the numbers. But uh, 10 people, about 10 people were in the first uh, year of the meditation when we had the first initial interview. Um, the religious backgrounds, vast majority, had Christian upbringing, which of course is quite important once you get to the conversations around what is religion, where does mindfulness sit, because if that is your understanding of what religion is, then I'll, yeah, it's going to make a massive difference. Um, and the dominant narrative plot um, this is not a derogatory term, it's a linguistic analysis term. It means the, the, uh, the story that they hinged their um, reason for being introduced to mindfulness. Why did I seek it out in the first place? Vast majority, 19 people, said it had something to do with mental health um, of, of, of various um, sort of degrees. Uh, three people were introduced to mindfulness through their networks, meaning a friend was doing a class, asked them to come along. Four people wanted to learn mindfulness or learned mindfulness because of self-regulation um, purposes. They wanted to control their uh, external behavior. And, so, um, and six people were serial seekers. Uh, that means they arrived at mindfulness because they did something else. They did a yoga, and then they were, oh, now I want to do mindfulness. Or they did participate in some Buddhist tradition, and now they thought, OK, maybe that's too much. I want to do mindfulness. They were serial seekers. Um, and that's a religious studies term that I'm borrowing. OK, so let me take a sip of water. <laughs> OK. At first glance of this material, something that was quite striking and jumped out at me <clears throat> was how many people actually changed their careers as a result of going to a mindfulness course. And mind you, they went there mainly because they wanted to deal with their mental health issue or support that in some sense. So yeah. 17 people in total changed their career. 11 of them entirely quitted their jobs, typically in the corporate world, to become a mindfulness teacher. Um, and six incorporated mindfulness in their existing careers. For instance, if they're a university lecturer, if they are well, a therapist, uh, and so on. Um, 15 no changes. And I'm going to give you an example. 
This is Emma's first interview. She says, I'm realizing that the possibility of me to go out with mindfulness will probably need me to move somewhere. She is in a very conservative US state, working in a corporate world. And she's saying, if I come out and say, oh, mindfulness, I need to quit my job. It's not well received. I'm opening up to the fact that maybe this marketing isn't the career trajectory uh, I want any longer. Ooh, second interview. By the time that I talk to her again, in about a year, she's quit her job, works for a nonprofit, moved to a blue state, and is teaching mindfulness. Um, to, what else is changing? Uh, Juno, from the Buddhist perspective, the key line is that the relief of suffering for all beings, and I do believe that. I believe we have the capacity to relieve suffering in other beings, and we can equally enable others to develop capacities within them. And that's kind of reflected in my job. I have this sense of purpose in my job as an academic who is also teaching mindfulness. I want you to pay attention to the nuances of the language she's using. Essentially, these people at the outset are telling me something has changed so drastically in my values that I have to change a career because it doesn't work anymore for me. What else changes? The way they talk. That particular use of vocabulary, something that I find quite interesting, and so many examples of this in, in the uh, data. So I ask, um, what's the goal of meditation? And Penelope says, well, interesting. So the Buddhist learning is that there's never a goal. My original goal was something, right? So adopting the acceptable way of talking is the point that I'm hammering home here. All right, so now let's look at the trajectories. And I'm kind of slicing, I'm focusing only on the atheists or the people who either at the interview self-identified as atheists or found the label appropriate for their position. And I'm going to outline four uh, basic kind of uh, trajectories. These are not watertight. There's movements between them. Um, but first thing that they share is all the participants talked about the um, scientific literature. That phrase, the Harvard study, was you know, constantly thrown at me. They referenced from a series of uh, scholars. They quote from them in the interviews. They quote from YouTube videos, as you have already seen, um, and you will see more. Um, so ACS Meditate, uh, these are the books that were typically uh, referenced, works of Stephen Batchelor, Robert Wright, and Sam Harris. So what do these scholars, authors talk about? They point to a view of mindfulness that's something more than just dealing with your anxiety. They point to uh, mindfulness being an actually an existential path, it's being an ethical path. They talk about different teachings, which are actually Buddhist teachings, but and concepts like dependent origination, uh, detachment, uh, suffering, uh, the Four Noble Truths, but they're not pitched as the Buddhist concept. They are pitched in a secular, um, scientific language. And the participants are aware of this rebranding. As Alfred says, you say potato, I say potato. You say dukkha, and I say discrepancy-based processing. It's not that they, they don't, they're just like, well, you know, if it's, you know, I, I have a purpose. I'm going to help people. If I'm helping people, who cares about this rebranding? All right, so first trajectory that I'm going to look at is the secular Buddhist. My argument is um, atheists who have a particular, uh, you know, socialization. These are the people who... Um, usually go and take a meditation retreat after they've done an MBCT course. They, um, this is the point I need my notes. Um, a lot of sort of commonalities between people and in this stage. Um, what do I want to say? All right. They follow Sila. They follow the Buddhist code of conduct in their 
day-to-day -day life, which is quite a fascinating thing. Um, again, people who are atheists, they take mindfulness from mental health, you know, end up living in accordance to sila. Uh, they have a, um, you know, follow secular Buddhist sort of rearticulation or interpretation of the Four Noble Truth uh, in a very scientific, disworldly approach and so on, and that any supernatural elements of Buddhist teaching, of Buddhism, is just the cultural baggage of India. We don't need that. Buddhism 2.0, as Stephen Batchelor talks about. I'm going to give you an example of Marv as a person that I'm categorizing in this trajectory. At the point of the first interview, you can already see there is change happening in the way Mark is talking. Marv, um, and he's, it's been eight months since he's done an MBCT course, and he took it because of depression. Um, and already you can see he's saying, well, I would self-describe as an eager and emerging Buddhist, you know, an atheist Buddhist. Um, it's a strange word to use. Uh, it's a strange word for a self-avowed atheist to use, but I'm having faith that, you know, these states, pleasant or unpleasant, are impermanent. So, you know, talking, this is an index of I'm having this understanding that before I was, you know, then I used to thought, now I know what's happening. In the second interview, um, Marv has quitted his job. He is developing his own brand of mindfulness and sports. Um, lots of other changes happened that I'm not going to spend too much, but he says, I think people who don't do meditation can be happy, but I think they will always be chasing something because I think they'll definitely, well, I'll bring it back to the Buddha because I think they'll definitely be living in, you know, the realm of dukkha and the first noble truth sense. So this is a marker of extending that view to other people. Other people who are not meditating, they're suffering because X, Y, Z. Um, what are the more important things I want to say? Uh, something that I wasn't expecting in the data is that this trajectory involved people having a shift in, the, in their understanding of religion, in the way they talked about religion. Um, Marv, at this point of the second interview, he didn't find the term atheism appropriate anymore for his position. Uh, in fact, he th thought it's a, it's a word that's divisive, it uh, makes me feel lonely. Um, I'm, I'm chucking that away, okay? So a lot of change happens. Um, but they also there, there's a shift in the discourse on religion, and this is consistent with the literature on non-religion and atheism. Um, here's Hector, who at the first interview says, I was an atheist all my life. My feelings about religion has changed since practicing mindfulness. I stopped seeing religion quite as much as a threat and more as a place you can go for resources. Things like meditation and yoga are technologies human beings develop to be able to access these potentials, these potentials, innate potentials. Um, if we understand them that way, religions, then we can take the curse off religion and be able to go for it for inspiration. A year later, I often work with chakra clearing exercises. I find it very, very helpful. There's always that question for me, why are you doing this? I have to justify it to myself. So even though I don't believe in these systems, you know, the Indian energy systems where these ideas are based on, I can still use these technologies. When you practice, and if you're really honest, you have to admit to yourself that life is really mysterious. So I'm using this as an example to demonstrate this shift from I'm a self-avowed atheist to becoming, working with chakras and, and, give, and being able to kind of s accept that some things can be mysterious. This is an index of movement towards an ex agnostic position. Certain questions are allowed not to have answers. Yeah, is that clear? Okay, but that's not the case for everybody. Not everybody moves through these, um, not everybody in the group of people I spoke with <laughs> I should say, uh, has these extreme patterns of change. Here's an example of a person who remained quite um, sort of 
committed to her non-religious um, position, let's say. So first interview with Marge, she kind of introduced herself or presented herself as, you know, um, I grew up, my, my entire family are scientists, you know, I'm a critical thinker, and I meditate for mental health, and she meditates on the app. And it's like sometimes, you know, this guy on the headspace, Andy, he says, send good vibes out, and really it pisses me off, uh, she says. So it's like wishing compassion to other people in your area, in your country, in the world. Is there a real world meaning to that? Um, whether me sending good vibes to somebody who I know is in a hospital has any real effect, I don't know. I suspect perhaps not. <laughs> but it doesn't bother me. I, I'll do it anyway. Um, OK, cool. Uh, I remembered this story, and I was really curious. Next, day, next year, I spoke with Marge. I'm like, Marge. You know, do you remember you said this last time we spoke? How are you feeling about that now? Is there still some things in Andy's teaching that annoy you, that you feel like you have a conflict with? And she's like, oh, about that, I conducted my 10-day experiment. Um, I, there's this woman at the post office, my local post office. She's very grumpy. She never smiles at me. So I meditated 10 days and sent her good vibes, meta meditation, and to see if anything changes. Um, and I'm like, okay, so anything changed? Like, well, she gave me a smile, but I don't think it was because of me sending good vibes. I think maybe me contemplating on that allowed me to see, okay, maybe she is going through something, be more compassionate toward her circumstances. But anyway, she did give me a smile. I don't really think it was the good vibes alone, something else. I'm using this as an index of, yes, she remains committed to her sort of non-religious look and approach to this. But her, you know, the rest of the interview did show that she had softened uh, her critique and sort of um, her critique of religion and religious sentiments. How are we on time? <clears throat> oh, OK, let's cruise. So last trajectory, moving to a, what I'm calling spirituality. The discourse of people in this category um, is a kind of weird mixture of spiritual but not religious, but also Buddhist modernist discourse. Uh, what they all shared is a spiritual experience that set them off into this direction. And I'm using Zoe as an example. And these are people who like go to Buddhist uh, centers to, as, a, uh, as a way to kind of have that environment to meditate. Zoe says, and she's a teacher, I've started to deepen my practice so for about four years. I've done it every day. I meditate sometimes. At a Buddhist monastery, I had what I would class as a spiritual awakening. Uh, I became one with everything for a couple of hours, and that really changed my life. Since then, I've been really on a much more spiritual path. I teach mindfulness as a secular way. But myself, I'm much more interested in a spiritual side now. I don't think you can have that experience and still call yourself an atheist, OK? What is remarkable here, first of all, there is a reorientation towards transcendental realities, uh, movement from I'm an atheist to I believe in something else is out there. Um, and usually, people took that experience as a temporal marker. Then I, before, a life before, and a trajectory forward. Um, what is a bit sad is that people like Zoe, who teach mindfulness, aren't allowed to talk about this side of their journey. In fact, Zoe keeps this as a, a, a private, uh, even from her spouse. And people like Zoe are, were really curious. They always ask me, um, am I the only person? And I'm like, no, you're not the only person. <laughs> there are other people who are going through the same. So, so what? Is, does this mean that mindfulness is a religion for non-religious people? Um, I'm going to say, for people like Zoe, 100%, once we have that crossing, that reorientation towards a transcendental reality, yes, that's definitely a marker. But it depends on people's definition of religion. Most of my career, I was a Gertz fan 
Um, religion is a system of some, it's like so broad that could be used to include anything as religion. Uh, at this point of my career, and following Martin Rosebird, who says, and I'm paraphrasing, he said, some people feel more comfortable to stretch the definition of religion to a point of meaninglessness than to admit some people don't believe in supernatural entities anymore. Um, so at this point in my career, I find that having that hard line of if there are supernatural sensibilities, if there are beliefs in something higher power, that is a marker for me of religion. Uh, if not, well, you know, instead of having this debate, is secular Buddhism religion and so on, how about we just look at the way people rationalize it? And this is the marker of suspending your analytical reasoning that I hinted earlier. Um, the way mindfulness figures, Kabat-Zinn, Kraken, all these um, major figures, the way they deal with this tension, is mindfulness a religion, is to say, well, it's not, because we have science-backed evidence. It's not because we have mindfulness centers in academia. How could a university like Oxford University have a mindfulness center if it was religious? It's not because we're dealing with people's mental health. In fact, that is a quite a fascinating one. People would shut me down on the question of, do you think it's religion? And they would say, I'm doing it because it's helping my men mental health. So kind of cutting me abruptly in that conversation. Uh, it's not because it's improving people's resilience. I don't even know what that means. Uh, it's not because it's a universal technique. It's not because why should we care if it's helping to you know, release people from suffering? So the Buddhist discourse, that's actually used as a rhetoric. All right, so how much time do I have now <laughs> to introduce you to a, yeah? Okay, so introduce you to this article fresh out of press um, that I did with my colleagues, uh, Valerie Van Molokum and uh, Miguel Farias, um, my two colleagues at Coventry University. So we've developed this scale to measure all these underlying assumptions and beliefs people have about the power of mindfulness. It's a mixed method using the same set of interviews uh, and um, we, to develop the scale. And the scale came from the analysis of the first ba batch of the interview. So we're like, oh, we need to include these items in. Um, validated against uh, FFMQ. I think I have a slide. I don't understand statistics. <laughs> But my colleague assured me that it is significantly correlating with all facets of mindfulness. We measure frequency and length of people's meditations and also their several report measures of spirituality and religion. I'll give you a few minutes to just look at these items. So in the qualitative section of this work, I analyze the data under three subheadings of interpersonal relationship and compassion. And I'm going to start there. Uh, and my argument is essentially that all of these beliefs that we've created into items are undergirded by a series of assumptions that are themselves based on metaphysical claims, epistemic claims, uh, ideologies, uh, and, and ideas like metaphysical um, notions about the nature of self, about the nature of mind, and about the nature of reality. And that all of these are actually predicated on um, broader cultural trends, such as, for instance, what Taylor calls expressive individualism, uh, other trends like what Scharf talks about in his work of perennial theory, um, perennial philosophy, 
and things that later that are actually you know, developing the romantic period, but then later become the core tenets of new age movement. Okay, so I'm going to unpack those underlying assumptions embedded in these uh, uh, items of the scale. So when the people talk about their how mindfulness helped their interpersonal relationship, they always, you know, reported or, or the stories they told sat on a spectrum between mindfulness helped me to become an engaged listener and take your opinion in and deal with you and respond to you to mindfulness helped me to become a disassociate, disengaged person where I'm not going to waste my energy on you. I'm going to walk away and you deal with that because that's your shit and it's not my shit to deal with. And I'm giving you an index of the latter, okay? Uh, or how I can control myself and my exterior expression to the point of here's James uh, just a few days before his father dies of cancer and recounting a conversation with a sister and saying, and my sister told me I don't know how you can how you can be upset, you're not crying. And I didn't have an answer, but I think it's because I can choose my thoughts. Uh, with mindfulness, I found that I can control or choose my thoughts and what to think, okay? What's happening here is that despite this diversity, everybody thought it's helped them. Everybody thought that mindfulness has made them a more pro-social person, right? And if it's such a massive difference, my argument here is that um, it's a subjective interpretation. And so when we have these scales that measure, did mindfulness help you this? And people say, yes, well, you know, pro-social from whose perspective? Because you can argue from Lilith's mom's perspective, she's been very rude. She's been antisocial. If I don't want to engage with you to have a conversation and say, I'm not gonna waste my energy on you, bye. I, f I don't think that's a pro-social behavior. So from whose perspective are we talking about? And so it's quite important to pay attention to that. But really, I'm going to now get into other assumptions. And when people talk about this, they also talked about uh, compassion. Again, you have a continuum between people who emphasize self-compassion to people who emphasize compassion for other people, being compassionate to other people. But when you probe them, OK, so how does mindfulness actually help you to cultivate compassion? They have two basic assumptions. Either we are, compassion is something that is innately human ability. I'm born with it. But that mindfulness helped me unleash it, right? So there is an assumption about in deep down, we are compassionate beings. We are born a good person but whatever happens, life happens. And that mindfulness is a tool that helps me to uh, unleash that, as, as Penelope's example shows. I must have those qualities inside me. I believe that everybody has these qualities inside them. But if I compare myself to people who perhaps haven't practiced mindfulness, there seems to be a difference. You know, mindfulness helped me to uh, bring it out. Or that they think that their conception of compassion is based on this concept of monistic oneness, you know, we're all one. So that understanding helps me to be compassionate to other people. And this is pretty much what kabat pushes with his concept of um, interconnectedness and emptiness uh, and so on. The underlying point here is that these are metaphysical assumptions that people take. Um, then the category of peace and violence. I'm having Rhiannon here as an example um, about how people think that if we practice meditation, there will be less violence in the world. In fact, this is during the period that Trump had just came into power. I had so many people say, if Trump and his supporters meditated, the world would be fantastic, wouldn't it? If these authority figures, people in power meditated, we won't have injustice. Inequality in the world would go away. Yes, you know, this and this and that. My argument here is that, again, this is based on the assumption that we are innately good and that this meditation has the ability to bring that out. 
right? Which is again making an assumption about nature of self, about nature of human beings. But here, um, I'm going to read this. People who see combat are in crazy amount of stress, and a lot of times come back from you know Middle East or whatever. I'm from the Middle East, so I was a little bit upset with this, <laughs> um, or whatever, with PTSD. And from what I understand, mindfulness is a great way to mitigate the effects of PTSD. So I would vote for it. I'm definitely not cool with the whole history of British and American imperialism. I think that's really not a good idea. But we also have to deal with what it is. And maybe, you know, if the soldiers do that, they will put, quit the army altogether. So out of the 32 people, 30 had unbounded support for such interventions, right? But 15 of them actually thought that if soldiers meditated, they are bound to see the humanity in other and put their guns down and quit the army and get another job, um, which is a little bit of a optimistic sort of view. But really what I want to also stress here is that aside from all these assumptions that they are making, it's accompanied with a sense of passive acceptance. Imperialism is bad. Well, it is what it is, um, which I don't think is quite useful for the world we live in right now. The, the other assumption or the category that I'm using is uh, mindfulness being this tool that helps you to quiet your mind um, and access this state that exists within you that is untouched by all the drama, all the life experiences, all the sociocultural influences, influences of this and that. But there is this pure state in, inside you, I don't know, in your head, in that authentic self, that voice that knows what's right and wrong. And when you meditate, it helps you to peel away these layers, um, the chatter mind, to access that voice. And here's Basil uh, kind of um, making this claim. And again, like so many people have written on this, uh, Schaff talks about it as a particular take on perennial theory, the idea that, you know, there is such a thing, first of all, another assumption, and that, you know, once you quieten this sort of mind that constantly, you know, is, is filtering stuff and interpretations of things, you can access that ultimate reality within you, right? And this sort of discourse is uh, interestingly very popular with scholars who write on near-death experience. That's something I teach about um, in my job as a lecturer. Uh, I, I teach on death, so I know that literature quite well. They use the same idea, basically saying people who have a clinical death, um, you know, all of a sudden, all that mind sort of um, filter, um, all that processes of the mind shuts down and, and they actually experience reality as it is. As in, they go through a tunnel, they talk to Jesus, they see dead relatives, that's the unfiltered reality. Okay, so I'm just showing you how this discourse works, okay? All right, so all of those assumptions are coded into the scale and there's actually we can see that the more people meditate, the more they're socialized into this, the more higher they score on that scale. And here's some numbers, which you probably understand them better than I do. Um, it, yeah, it, it correlates perfectly with all of the facets of mindfulness, which begs the question, are those things that these measures measure <laughs> Is it people's beliefs or is something actually a mechanism of change that's taking place or both? So we're pitching that as a way to combat a lot of those shortcomings of just simply relying on people's self-measure of I became more mindful, but you know, putting and taking account of the sociocultural context and how these can change uh, and influence people's beliefs and expectations of the powers of mindfulness. Tada. That's it. <laughs> 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 <laughs>